to Psalm 118 this evening, Psalm 118. Great truths, of course, throughout the whole Word of God, but one very great little truth that underpins everything and helps us to continue on for the Lord with his great support. Psalm 118. Now, let's uh, pick it up tonight from, we'll just pick it up from verse number five, and we'll read down through to the end of verse number 14. So Psalm 118. And then let us read on together, starting in verse number five. The word of God says, I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man, what can man do unto me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desires upon my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations compass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compass me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They compass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sword, I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. And we'll end our reading there. And may the Lord be pleased to bless the reading of his word to our hearts this evening. Of course, now, this is a psalm that may at first sense seem a little confusing to some in parts where we read, and we're not going to go through the psalm doctrinally tonight. Doctrinally is placed for the nation of Israel coming to the end of the tribulation and the nation of Israel praising God for the freedom as he delivers them through and out the other side of Jacob's trouble. That's what we see doctrinally in the references to Christ's work in that, okay, but we, we, we're not going to look at that this evening. I just want you to know as you read that, you think, what does that mean? That's that's the setting. This is to do with the nation of Israel in the yet future time of Jacob's trouble, uh, the terrible enemies that will surround them, and the Lord's coming to relieve them at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so don't worry if a few things didn't make too much sense to you there. Hopefully that setting will help you to understand it. Could I draw your attention with me tonight back uh, to verse number six, please, if you would. And I wonder if we were going to all read the first part up to the semicolon. Let's read it together. The Lord is on my side. Let's read it again. The Lord is on my side. Easy to read. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Now look up to me and say it again. The Lord is on my side. And again, the Lord is on my side. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Father, oh, what a promise. And despite the doctrinal setting of the psalm, that's the truth. All the way through the scriptures, a truth to your people. And in this New Testament body of Christ, it's no less true, Lord. You are on our side. We have victory and are victorious because of your incredible promises and provision through the glorious work of Christ our Savior to all those who know him tonight. And Father, as we go through this life serving you, loving you, worshiping you, as this world turns darker, as this world uh, brings upon us distress and difficulty, as things will indeed descend into perilous times in these last days, May we remember these words ringing in our heart that you not forsake us. Oh, Father, lift your people tonight. Remind us of your glorious promise and provision. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our great Savior. Amen. 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 The Lord is on my side. What more do we need to know? Well, He's given us substance behind that. How wonderful is that? 
But I hope you know that tonight. I hope they're, they're not just words in the Bible. I hope they're not just words that we speak. But I hope you know tonight, and you can say that with me, because you're saved, you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is yours, and you are his. And you can say, no matter what comes in this world, eternity is my hope. Uh, heaven is my home, and through every day and every way, the Lord is on my side. What a wonderful truth that is. Do you know, God wants us to start, and that's the title of the message tonight, by the way, the Lord is on my side. I couldn't think of a better one than the Bible gave us. God wants us to start each day afresh and anew with eager anticipation. Eager anticipation that he has his best for us in any given day. Because that's the promise of his word. No matter and despite how any given day may seem, we may wake in the morning with the problems of yesterday, with the distresses of yesterday. We may carry them through the night and into the next day. But God says, wake up knowing I am your son. I have my best for you today. I have my provision for you. Day. And that's the same for any given day. The Lord wants us to know that he's out working his perfect plan with his perfect provision, holding to his perfect promises given to us in his perfect word. And that's what he wants us to know, that he is on our side. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. No matter whether we wake up straight or bent out of shape, it does upside down or right ways up, no whether the, whether the world is spinning or still, the Lord is on our side. It reminds us of that in James 1, 17. Don't turn there tonight, um, included in his prayer. But, but just think of this. This is why he wants us to know that every day the Lord is on our side. Every good, uh, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In essence, this word tells us that everything that everything of the goodness of heaven is given to us from our Father above. It comes down from heaven to us on earth, and with him there's no variation. There's no changing, and there's no turning away. The promise is he has his best for us every single day. So if we, if we know of a certainty, the truth of the scripture, that the Lord is on our side, and he has his perfect provision and promises for us every day from heaven to earth, then truly, truly, what can knock us off our stride? It should be nothing, shouldn't it? It should be nothing. Let's just look at a few points from the psalm tonight. We can't do the whole psalm justice, even all the verses that we've read justice. But hopefully a few thoughts that may be helpful for you tonight. Uh, from verse number five, let's draw our attention back there to where we started. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Um, and, and, and there's a great truth here because if the Lord is on our side, he tells us he, he moves us from distress to deliverance. I called upon the Lord in distress. Sometimes one of the things we'd have to admit to our shame is that's when we, that's when we call upon him the most, isn't it? In the times of distress. But he doesn't mind. He knows that, that we do call upon him in our times of distress. And set me in a large place. Let, let me explain this to you. In times of great difficulty, stress, distress, trial, troubles, doesn't matter whether it's finance related, family related, job related, health related, just world related, a time of distress. Have you ever felt crushed or claustrophobic, like hemmed in, like the, like the world is becoming, your world is becoming a really small place and it's closing in around you? And there's, there's no getting out from under it. You feel really trapped, really tight, really, you know, just really closed in. In such a time like that as a Christian, have you ever kind of just put everything down and gone out into a big, large space? I mean, we're blessed in the in the area of the country in which we live. I mean, maybe you've got into the in the middle of nowhere. Maybe you've just got into the park. Maybe you've just gone into the center of your backyard, whatever it is. But you've just got out into some space and spent some time just in prayer with the Lord. Just let him know. It feels like the weight of the world is upon your shoulders and, and you're struggling to hold it all up. It's like a ton of concrete. He's going to just crush you into the floor. And you spend some time just looking at his creation, spending some time in prayer. And that, and that burden just lifts and you feel like you're just in the middle of an open space and you can breathe again. And everything is glorious. And your situation hasn't changed. That's a large space. That's what it means. 
I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. He said, I've taken you from a place of being compressed and distressed, no matter where we are. And we called upon the Lord and he's answered us and he set us in the same circumstances, feeling as if we're in the midst of nowhere. We've got freedom and we can breathe again. He is, he, you feel very differently, very much at liberty with the Lord. You're one with the Lord, but has your situation changed? Your situation has not changed, but we're in a large place. We've gone from distress to deliverance. <coughs> this psalm was the uh, reformer, Martin Luther's favorite psalm. Remember Martin Luther, 1517, I think it was, was it 1517, yes. Now there's 95 theses to the door at, uh, at Wittenberg, you know, and uh, it wasn't the only reformer, but he was a catalyst really to, to the start of what would be the great reformation from Europe, uh, which we're about to look at in our church history uh, on a Friday evening. And the darkness and the dark yoke uh, of the superstitious dark ages of Catholicism was broken at that time. And you remember, he, he, he was kind of uh, uh, running for his life in many ways. I think it was it Frederick the Elector that gave him, uh, gave him sanctuary. But he said this psalm was nearest to his heart. And he believed this, he believed the promise of God, and he believed God himself saved him from those Catholic authorities who were looking to wipe him out because he was a problem. But certainly they could not. Why? Because the Lord was on his side. And he knew that and he trusted that. And this psalm was so near and dear to him and carried him through everything. He said, what do we find in that? Well, the Lord delivers you from distress, but sometimes he delivers you in distress. You're not taken from the situation that was crushing and distressing you, but he delivers you in that situation so it will not crush you. It will not finish you and you can breathe. Let's be honest. You could be in a prison cell and the truth of God's word in this is you might be in the tiniest cube of a concrete block staring at a daylight through a few little square holes and feel like the world is closing in around. I don't know if any of you have been in a prison cell, but you can feel pretty claustrophobic. And God says, even there, he says, you cry unto me in your distress and I'll put you in a large place. That little concrete block will become like the freedom in the midst of God, what God says. He said, because I am on your side. If we're one of his, he will take us from distress to deliverance. That's why how we know the Lord is on our side. Secondly, let's have a look at verses 6 and 7. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can men do to me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that Hate me. Secondly, the Lord is on your side because he says he will take you from worry to victory. Now, there's a great question asked here, isn't there? Uh, at the end of verse 6, look at this question. What can men do unto me? Well, that's a question that is asked. And from our understanding, we don't have, a, have to have a great understanding, but from our understanding from the entirety of human history or even just the last 2,000 years of church history, if we ask that question and answer it honestly, what can man do to me? Quite a lot. He can imprison you. He can punish you. He can torture you. He can kill you. He can take your family from you. He can take your finances from you. He can take your jobs from you. From you, And I could go and on and on and on. What can man do to me? Some of the worst things that are possible for a human being to experience even up to and ultimately ending in taking your life away from you. And, and, and our understanding from history and truth, and that's even going on in the world today for many Christians, would naturally cause us to worry. Or should cause us to worry if we've got half an ounce of common sense. You know, uh, turn to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8. How do we go from worry to victory? When we know the world can do some of the worst things, even within our own country, we could, we could see a time in this great land of ours that we live in where true Bible-believing Christians will be suppressed and oppressed, prevented from employment, could possibly have children taken away from us. 
no opportunity to homeschool. I mean, we could just, you know, without even getting into the realms of seriousness, we could see very much, and we can see on the horizon, how very, very difficult it's going to get very, very quickly. Employment, that'll be gone, that'll be finished. So... Torture, imprisonment, fear, distress, financial poverty, loss of job, loss of status, loss of citizenship, you name it, it goes on and on. What shall we then say to these things? God before us, who can be against us? That's how he takes us from word to victory. Carry on down to verse number 37. Take a look down there at verse number 37. Now, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. Super victory is what that means. Through him that loved us. We can ask the question, what can man do to us? The answer, truthfully, is a whole lot of things we wouldn't want done. And God says, you don't need to worry about that. You're more than that. The whole world can be against you, but if I am for you, then you are in the majority. Worry not. See what God is saying to the psalmist, and by extension to us tonight, quite simply is this, the Lord is on your side. And he will move you firstly spiritually, many, many times physically as well, from a place of worry to a place of victory, if you know the Lord is on your side. Let's go a little further. Now, we've got a big chunk here from verses 8 to 12. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Look at this. All nations compass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compass me, you know, wrap themselves around. They compass me about, yeah, they compass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compass me about like bees. Like a swarm of angry bees, that's how the enemies of the nations were and will be. They are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. That's a pretty serious sounding situation there, isn't it? Would you, would you just look there at verse number 10, the start of it? All nations if all nations were composite about God's people, for all nations to come together, they have to be what? United. They have to be united nations. Isn't God's word wonderful? Isn't God's word wonderful? It must be united nations. One world globalism is the greatest satanic delusion this world faces. It is the road to the end. It is not the road to utopia. Far from it. But make no mistake about it. We can see what's going on out there. From farming to finances, it's all changing. They want our food. I don't know whether you kind of are seeing this around you, but you've got Bill Gates and his cronies buying up farms in America. Just the other day up here in Somerset, just the other last, uh, I think it was this week, I said, no, the end of last week, farmers outbidded to buy further grazing land from their cattle by a vegan group being financed. So the land that should be used to feed the cows that provide the meat that we need to keep us healthy being bought up by people who are part of a wider thing. There's a, uh, you, you only got to have a look at Holland. You, you got to see what's going on. All that's happening out there is the farmland is being bought up by people who will not allow meat. Why? Is it going to make us healthier? No. You can't control a cow. A cow births a cow, and a cow births a cow, and whoever owns the cow can eat, right? But you can control seeds, especially genetically modified seeds because they don't produce seeds that produce seeds. And you have to buy special fertilizers to get them to grow. So what do you get? Then you get big global corporations that control your access to food. And they control the food that you can have. 
They control the movement that you can have to get the food. They control your digital currency, of which depend on how good a citizen you are as to whether you can even have any food. And they control when you've not got the right food because they've restricted the food and you're not allowed the motion to get your exercise and vitamin D and on top of all that. When it runs to you getting ill, then they control your access to health care. So what stands better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man? It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. From farming to finances, there is a plan of complete authoritarian control that, quite frankly, makes the old-fashioned Soviet rock communism look positively libertarian. It's shocking what is coming. You say, well, what if the Lord is on my side? What does it mean, Pastor? If the Lord's on our side, he'll take us from the world's provision to the Lord's provision. That's what he says. Better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. God says you don't put your trust in a government. You don't put your trust in royalty. He says put your trust in me. Why? Because it's much safer to depend on God's help and protection. Right? Because God can do what he pleases, and no one can stop him. And God is held to his promises because he made them. God is consistent with his word, for he changeth not. And he says, I'm on your side. It's going to get bad. Trust me. Trust me. I will provide for you. Why? Because if we put all of our trust and start to really trust, if, if, if we let fear and the worry of men bring a snare, and we go, oh, we just got to come, become dependent upon governments. We know the problem with that. Their decisions change. Their loyalties change. Governments change. Their armies and forces and powers wax and wane. Everything, they die. It's not consistent, it's not constant, but our God changes not. And he said, don't put your trust in government, don't put your trust in princes. All nations, the United Nations may compass you about and try to bring you down to a close. Look, can, can, can any doubt that just the last few years and what we've seen, Many people very fearful. I think the country and the nations and the world are split into two. Those who become even more sheep-like than they ever were, it's all good, nothing problem, nothing to see here, move along. And those of us who responded to the Apostle Paul who said, come on, Christians, it's high time to awake, and we look at it and go, okay, I got it. I see it now. And you know what I'm so very, very thankful for is they see these things, the control of farm and the control of bank. In the control of our of movement, removal of cars. And, you know, it's like question, we should get up, we should fight about that. But, but I see it, it's already completely in place. It just has not dropped yet. And it's so overwhelming, thankfully, like it's coming. And there ain't nothing. God's word says it's coming. I can see it like a cloud on the horizon. It's like, who's, who's old enough to remember the old fashioned game, Aliens, the arcade game? You know, where you were one, remember they come down in the big lines, do, 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 and you were like one moving side to side. Do, do, Shooting, and it's just like a cloud coming, boom, 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 boom. That's what it's like stacked out there in the world today. It's coming down, boom, 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 boom. But only Christians, it seems, can see it, right? You look out and you go, uh oh. Now, some Christians might decide to go, boom, 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 <laughs> boom, 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 boom. We're gonna fight them, boom, 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 boom. It's coming. God says, don't worry about that, put your trust in me. Do not worry about it. Don't worry about what about my provision? What will we do? God says, don't worry about the world's provision. Put your trust in the Lord, not your confidence in man. It's much, 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 much safer. So while well, we're in the Psalm, just turn to Psalm 56. If you weren't old enough to remember Space Invaders, well, probably Google it. You can probably find that on Google, I, I have no doubt. In fact, most of you probably aren't old enough to remember Space Invaders. Psalm uh, 56, is look at verse number four. In God, I will praise his word. Why? Because it's his word. 
I know for many Christians that's got to be a time of difficulty these days because so many of them aren't sure whose word they've got in their hands, right? How would you know what to trust for? Is this, is this one of those bits of the Bible that God wrote or is this one of these bits of the Bible that man wrote that's got mistakes in it, should be there, shouldn't be there? I tried to think what well, it must be. I can understand why some Christians are falling apart at the seams. They don't know they've got God's word. Every word of God's word in their hands, then I'd be a little concerned, right? Because the psalm we're reading through tonight, we're thinking, did God write this bit? Did man write this bit? Is this bit a mistake? Is this bit right? And you look out in the world and go, no way. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. What an incredible truth. The Lord says, have no fear. We know what's going on. Don't worry about it. I am on your side. Say it with me again. The Lord is on my side. Now, come on, say it. The Lord is on my side. Now, say it like you mean it. The Lord is on my side. And lastly tonight, let's come back to Psalm 118. Let's look at just verse 13 and 14. <clears throat> thou, thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. Now, the, word, the world will take a jab at you, thrust like a sword. The world will jab at us, sword. But the Lord help me. Now, look at this verse 14. The Lord is my strength and song and is become my salvation. Now, that my salvation, of course, starts at the salvation. And what salvation is. When we put our trust in Christ, when we surrender our sins and sinful nature to the Lord, when we surrender our all to him by simply believing and receiving the complete perfection of his goodness and his atoning work on the cross of Calvary, the full and final payment made, he calls us by grace through faith, to believe and receive that, and he washes us and he cleans us, he makes us pure and white as snow, and he makes us his own, and that's when we got saved, and that cannot change. That cannot change. And through all of our life, no matter what, what we face, because the Lord is on our side, he's become, if you will, my salvation. That does not change whatsoever. But here's, here's the bit I like. The Lord is my strength and song. You see, God is not only the source of our strength, but he is the subject of our songs of praises. Now, we could probably spend hours and hours, or as many people as there are in here tonight, arguing and having opinions about what are the right songs that we should sing, what are the right songs that we should listen to, what, you know, should we sing these songs, should we sing those songs, these are the right songs, these are the wrong songs. And you know what? As many Christians as you've got, that's as many opinions as you've got. But here's the one thing we cannot add. The Lord is my strength and song. We sing about him. We sing about him. He is the substance of our songs of praise. And that's what makes our wonderful, beautiful, truthful gift of the true religion, of the true truth of Christ, is we can sing about it. Because we're singing about him. He is the substance. He is the sun, the source, and the substance of it all. And we sing about him. We don't sing about us. We sing about him. Uh, just go to Nehemiah chapter 12, a, a wonderful verse. I, I, I wish the, the, there was time uh, to, to, to read it all, if you will. Nehemiah is a wonderful book of the Bible. Um, and Nehemiah chapter 12, of course, is, is, is absolutely excellent. The walls are built, the gates are up, everything is, is, is done. Um, in the book of Esther, that won't help me much. Let me just go back one. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 12. And you've got the situation where everything is being prepared for worship and groups of singers 
are being placed upon the walls above the gates and the trumpeters and everything is, is getting ready. Now, just, just look with me at this one verse. Nehemiah chapter 12 <clears throat> and verse number 46. Now, this is the Israelites. Now, remember, they've come back. They've rebuilt. They did that wonderful work under Nehemiah's Azur, Zerubbabel, and Ezra's. God. They've got all these wonderful things going on. And they look back in the days of their nation. They say, for in the days, verse number 46 of chapter number 12, for in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chief of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving unto God. It's a mark of God's people through all time. It's a mark of God's people through all time. You know, singing is an unnatural. The, the only people who sing today are pop stars and all the kids who want to be pop stars, don't they? You know, they, they all want to be a famous singer. But it's so unusual to have people who will actually sing and come together and publicly without force or finance actually voluntarily lift our voices in song to our God. Why? Because he's our strength. He's our song and he's our salvation. Who would not want to sing about that? God is saying because he's on our side, we can stand we can sing and we can be happy because the Lord is on our side. The Lord is on my side. One verse to finish, Hebrews 13, please, if you would. Hebrews chapter 13. And verse number, well, let's, let, let's go from verse number five, two verses. Hebrews 13, verse number 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. Let me just say this as we read this verse. Present tense, that says, the Lord is saying to us, President, be content with such things as you have now, right? Let's fast forward this a little bit. If we're alive long enough, that we haven't any more got than the things that we have now. We may have lost our jobs. We may have lost our homes. We may have lost children taken away from us. That, that's what Psalm 118 is saying to put our trust in the Lord. That's, imagine that if we, were, if we were reading this, if the Lord tarries a while and puts us through that thing, be content with such things as you have. Why? Because the Lord is on your side. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, verse number six, that's what I want. So that I, in consequence of, as a result of, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Look up. Look up. Look up, say with me, the Lord is on my side. The Lord is on my side. The Lord is on my side. Once more, the Lord is on my side. No matter what, that's my Father. Oh, we love you, our Lord. Father, you gave us your son to take our place on that cross. He endured it all, despising the shame. Lord, for that time on the cross, he even had to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because, Lord, for that season, he who knew no sin became sin for us. Oh, Lord, how could we doubt? How could we waver? Father, I pray for every one of us in here tonight, no matter whether all the nations united compass us around, no matter how our enemies may stab at us sore like swarms of bees, they may swarm around us. But your word says you're on our side and 
just well enough. Father God, I pray every single child of God in here tonight, no matter what they may be facing this day or tomorrow or this week to come, will have the words echoing in their head of the psalmist. And will say to every situation of challenge that they face, every every the words that will come into their mind, that your Holy Spirit will put into their mind, will be the Lord is on my side. Help us, by God and our Father, not just to say it, but to believe it because you are. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.